Hi, Facebook friends. Helen Arcantu here, CEO of the YWCA of Northern New Jersey. So happy to have some time with you together on this Wednesday afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this important conversation. Um, as you know, they, uh, our YWCA of Northern New Jersey created YWTV um, to help us stay connected and uh, keep us still a little social while we're social distancing. And we've used this platform to be able to inspire and educate on important issues during this time. And um, obviously in the last few weeks with the um, uh, events of the murder of George Floyd and now kind of the uh, continuing um, uh, outcry that has come from that and some new cases that have popped up obviously uh, we, as an organization who is, we are committed, our mission is to work to eliminate racism as well as empower women. And we do this work every day. But as these incidents have popped up over the last two weeks, um, we've sat and consulted with black leaders in our community and talked with them about ways that the YWCA can support and um, this, this time right now, what we're in. And through that, we've created a series of uh, conversations. And so with that, um, as some of you may have seen on Friday, we had a very powerful conversation mother to mother about uh, mothering black sons during this time. And if you didn't see it, I do encourage you to go watch it. It is on our Facebook page and it's still available for anyone to see. Um, this conversation today is also a continuing um, part of this series that we've created to be responsive to right now. Um, we've seen so many people um, come forward and be outraged uh, and, you know, we've even seen in the last week or two, people have changed their social media Facebook page to a black square, and there's been a lot of posting and conversations, which are wonderful. Um, I think it's really important um, for those of us in the community that are white people that want to know how we can actively help and support um, dismantling, dismantling systemic racism and helping support our um, black members of our community. Um, to you know, learn a little bit about ways that we can do that. And the term that um, many people have heard is white allyship. And uh, you know, unless you have already launched into some of the reading, which um, is available on our website, we do have a resource page for you on our racial justice um, page of our website, um, or you've done your own uh, uh, looking into some of the wonderful documentaries or books that are out there, um, but we thought that it would be important to have a conversation with you today about white allyship, explain a little bit about what it is, and to talk a little bit to some of the allies that I know in our community um, that have helped school me, and um, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity, hopefully, for us all to grow and learn. And so with us, I'm very proud to welcome our three guests today. And um, we have Bonnie Cushing, who is a licensed clinical social worker and an anti-racist organizer and educator. Uh, we have Courtney Carbone. She's a chairperson of the Community Relations Advocacy Network, um, which is part of the Municipal of Glenrock. And we have Marianne Woods-Murphy, who is the International Talent Development Specialist and Priority Schools Consultant. Um, she also was the winner of our Racial Justice Award at the YWCA a few years back. So. Um, thank you, ladies, for joining us. I'm so grateful to have you all here. And I know that you know, um, and you know, you've helped me learn um, that you know, allyship is not an identity; it's a process, and it's something that each of us, um, you know, it's a lifelong process. It involves work. It involves um, uh, education. It involves conversation, um, and conversations like this. So with that, let's jump right into it. So ladies, let's um, let's start with Bonnie. Hi. <laughs> Bonnie, thank you for joining us. Today. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So, so we know that, um, again, I'm so happy to have you here. Um, you're a licensed clinical social worker, as um, you know, we talked about for um, and over 25 years, you have been uh, connected to the racial and social justice movement. Um, you're a core trainer for the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, and a trainer with the Center for Racial Justice and Education, the Eichenberg Academy for Social Justice, and the Soul Focused Group. 
Um, for those of you watching, Bonnie is also the co-founder of both the Anti-Racist Alliance North Jersey chapter and its affinity group, the European Descent New Jersey. She's been the vice president of the board for the Center for the Study of White African Culture for the past Amer decade. American uh, American. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. The white American. I'm sorry. That's She's okay. For the Center for Study for the White American Culture for the past decade, where she also develops curriculum and co-facilitates workshops on issues on white culture, white privilege, and white identity. Um, I personally have sat through the Undoing Racism training with Bonnie as one of my trainers, and um, she's been a guiding force for the YWCA and for myself um, over this time as we have launched our initiative and uh, uh, and you know continue to do our work um, to work to eliminate racism in our community. So Bonnie, thank you so much, so much for joining us today. I'm glad to be um, here. Thank you for inviting. So obviously, you were one of our trainers. Yes, yes. I, you know, you obviously were one of our trainers that um, came in and um, helped us do the undoing racism training in our community, which we were so fortunate to do thanks to a grant by our Bergen County Executive James today, one of our Bergen County freeholders who supported that initiative. Um, and that training was done and beyond and we had many nonprofit leaders from a community participate in that um can you tell uh, us a little bit about out there <laughs> you're freezing a little bit but i'd be happy to tell you about uh the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond and our Undoing Racism Community Organizing Workshop. It's two and a half days. Um, for me, uh, I've been on this journey for a good 30 years or so, even though I have always been interested in racism, but didn't really understand what it was, the nature of it, how it was created, how it's perpetuated, and what we can do to undo it. Uh, until later in my life, until I was in my early 30s. And uh, I've gone to so many different workshops, many of which are excellent, but I have to say the People's Institute has been the gold standard for me and for many other people. We've, we've trained over a million people, been around for 40 years. Uh, it just connected the dots for me. What the People's Institute on Doing Racism Community Organizing Workshop does is it is foundational in terms of having a shared language, a shared definition of what racism is, and also uh, an analysis of why and how it was created. Our belief is we say undoing racism because we know that racism was something that was done. It's not organic. Uh, it's not organic to human nature. And if we understand how it was done and why and how it perpetuates itself, how it evolves and shape shifts and adapts to whatever time it's existing in. It's lasted for close to 500 years. That if we know how it was done, we can undo it. Anything we know how it was done, constructed, we can deconstruct it. So I feel like, I don't know if people who are listening today, you know, have had a lot of uh, conversations about racism and somehow got the feeling that maybe you were talking about different things. Uh, because in the United States, racism is defined as whatever you think it is. Um, so it's really critical to start off in organizing, uh, having a, a shared definition. Or even if you don't agree what the shared definition we offer is, that is a starting point. It's also our belief that community organizing has been really the only thing that has ever changed anything in this country and uh, that racism has broken up every social movement in this country for justice, you know, be it the labor movement or the civil rights movement itself, the women's movement, the Occupy movement, uh, every movement gets busted up along racial lines. So we feel that to undo racism is to really address all of the oppressions and create a more humane and fully, fully just and equitable nation and culture. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of the People's Institute. 
Well, I, I can say from sitting through the training that it's very impactful and it does take you on a personal journey as well as a educational process, you know, simultaneously for sure. And I do encourage um, anyone who um, is interested, the YWCA will be offering this training again. And um, we do encourage you to stay active and even follow the People's Institute page to learn, you know, where and when it's being offered. Um, it's definitely very impactful. So, um, Bonnie, can you talk to us a little bit about the role that white people need to play in the anti-racist movement? Yeah, it's a, I can talk a little bit about it. I do want to, I, I do want to say something about uh, when you said, you know, what we can do right now and what's happening right now. And it's really important for us, particularly us who have been racialized as white, to realize that right now has been happening for over 400 years. We're just becoming aware of it. And even though I am filled with excitement and promise about how many white people are jumping up, speaking up, posting on social media, showing up at protests, there's a part of me that's concerned that after this issue is no longer trending, that people will drop off. They'll check the box, say, I did it. And this is really a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's been going on forever. And we're going to need to stay in it for the long haul. So I think that that's really important. Another thing that I've learned in doing this work, and I wasn't happy about it when I first learned about it, was that uh, all of the anti-racist leaders of color, uh, both historically and currently, that I've been blessed with either studying or being mentored by so generously, you know, has said that if you are white and you want to do something about racism, go home. Go home to your own community. Racism is an issue that was created by and for the benefit of white people. So we need to go back to our own white communities, our own white families, uh, our own white organization, white-led organizations, and do the healing there. Um, that's not to say that we're not doing it in solidarity with people of color. We're not doing it because we care about people of color and the injustices that they've had to endure for centuries. But we also need to do it for our own humanity because racism has robbed us of our own humanity and we can reclaim it by becoming anti-racists. Um, another thing is that in working in, within white spaces, as well as multiracial spaces, we can do the kind of internal work that you referred to, the way that we've internalized racial superiority, the way that we've internalized uh, uh, unearned racial advantage and taken it for granted and actually not even seen it. We've been socialized not to see it or acknowledge it. That we do this work among ourselves and su support each other in doing this work so that we're not giving an additional burden to our colleagues and friends of color. They don't need to do that heavy lifting. They don't need to hear us go through our grief process, a racial identity continuum um, uh, to, to watch and listen to our tears, which are important. We need to grieve what has been done to us and what we've been robbed of as well. So we need to do that work with and for each other. And we need to not call out each other, but all in each other, in, into this conversation and into a, a different way of life, because it really is about the way we, we walk this earth, not just how we work in our organizations or the protests and marches that we might participate in or the organizations that are black led and led by people of color that we might donate our funds to. So I think that that's really important. Um, Another thing it's, you know, and there's no recipe for this, unfortunately, but we need to uh, start to recognize when we must speak up, when we must step up, and also when we need to be silent and listen, and when we need to step down. We also need to learn how to take leadership and guidance from people of color, which is counter everything that we've been socialized about. Um, you know, we've been socialized and seen most of the authority figures in our life and in our country have been people who have looked like us and had white skin like us. So we need to be able to uh, elevate and lift and accept and listen to the guidance and leadership of anti-racist people of color. Um, another thing that 
I, I want to bring up, and it's not a critique, is that I've become less and less comfortable with the term ally. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been using the term uh, co-conspirator. Uh, I've been using the term uh, accomplice because I think that ally also kind of reinforces this idea that we're doing it. You know, it's, it's a problem that people of color suffer with uh, and, and that we're doing it to help them. Um, when really it is something that also harms us not to center white issues, but it does harm us and that we need to have our own white skin in the game. If we're doing this also for ourselves and for our children and all of the white people we love, our parents, um, our white community, then it's harder for us to leave when things get difficult. And I guarantee you, things are going to get difficult. It's going to get heated in there. So for us to be able to be sustained in this movement, we also need to do it out of self-interest because I believe human beings do act out of self-interest and, and that's just part of being human. Um, another thing I've been thinking about because there's been a lot and, and then I'll shut up, I'm sorry. No, 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 please. Like we're, covering, about this. <laughs> we're covering everything I wanted to, you know, to talk about, so please continue. Beautiful. I just, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the talk uh, the talk that black mothers, black fathers have to have with their children, also other people of color in terms of safety, not only with the police, but just safety in day to day moments, you know, safety while barbecuing, safety while, you know, jogging, um, safety while sitting in a Starbucks. So that is true. But I think it's important for us white people have been thinking more and more about the talk that I gave my white children, uh, which was a very different talk and needs to be expanded. Because my talk was about stand up for your rights, uh, demand respect. You know, if you're stopped by a police, ask for their badge number and their name. You know, things that uh, parents and caregivers of color definitely have to warn their children against doing. So that those are opportunities for us to really be thoughtful about how we're raising our children. And I wanna give a plug uh, for the Center for the Study of White American Culture. Um, we're doing actually tonight will be the second session of three um, virtually on how to raise anti-racist white children. Um, there's a, you know, we're offering it again in September. It actually happens to be sold out, but then there's another uh, session that's going to begin in November. And if you go to euroamerican.org, uh, and that's the website for the Center for the Study of White American Culture. You can register, and there's also a lot of really helpful resources there for both white people, and all of our workshops are open to not only people who are white, but people who are of any race, um, and uh, everyone is, is welcome, and it's a multiracial organization, um, but there's a lot of resources there for people who are white, interested in uh, learning how to be anti-racist, how to live an anti-racist life, and also uh, for people of color who are interested in understanding us better, although they understand us better than we understand ourselves, um, or in, in being able to stand in solidarity and support of us. Um, so I'll be a little quiet now. No, not at all, please. As I said, you're hitting all the spots that we wanted to cover in this discussion, and I know that the other ladies will expand and hit some of the others. Um, I just wanted to say, I'm glad that you brought up the piece about parenting. Um, we get that uh, question regularly. And of course, I as a parent, you know, also struggle with, you know, what, am I saying the right things? You know, what are the right things to say? So it's wonderful that there's options um, around uh, giving us some guidance on how to do that. And uh, the YWCA, just for everyone watching, to, just to know the same way that we're working to bring back the undoing racism training into our community. We're also working, you know, to bring this conversation about parenting and also for teachers as well, um, because we, you know, obviously systemic racism right now, the real focus of that conversation has been on policing because that's, you know, the, the tragedy that we watched, you know, on video in front of us, you know, two weeks ago. But the reality of it is all of our systems are this deeply, you know, as you know, Bonnie, and, you know, um, helped educate me and so many people on how it's so deeply embedded in so many of our systems in our education system in our child protective service system you know so many areas and conversations that we need to really you know shed a light and get all of the professionals who have power 
you know, in these systems, understanding, you know, these concepts and their role, you know, in keeping racism in place and also dismantling racism and how, you know, how they um, can be part of change. So I'm grateful that you talked about the parenting piece because there's so many layers to this. Yes. And, and I mean, there's so much more we can touch on. I look forward to maybe having further conversations, uh, you know, in, in uh, collaboration with the YWCA. But, you know, the role of guilt, shame, fragility, um, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of work to do. I, I'm someone who doesn't totally disagree with guilt. I don't think it's all bad. I think for me, it's been my conscience knocking on the door of my soul telling me I either have done something that I need to repair or that I failed to do something that I need to do. Um, but shame is about who you are. And, and none of us who are white have created this system. None of us, um, you know, asked to be born white. Uh, but we are responsible now that we are in this life and in this skin to do something about it. And these all every, in every system in this country was created at a time when uh, racial apartheid existed and was completely legal and unquestioned and was created exclusively by white people for the exclusive benefit of white people. So the civil rights movement pushed open the doors, forced open the doors of all of our systems, but never did anything to transform the purpose of those institutions. The, none of them are really broken. People say it's, you know, education system is broken. It's not broken. It's doing exactly what it was created to do in the first place. Same thing with child welfare. All of these systems are functioning as they were planned to. Um, so we really need to transform them. And uh, it's a wonderful life, by the way. I just want to say I do this work with a lot of hope. Uh, it's medicine for the soul. It's, it's a wonderful way to live life. It's a wonderful way to raise our children and our students. And, and children that we care give. Because if we're not raising them as anti-racist white children, uh, white supremacists are very successfully recu recruiting, very successfully right now recruiting our children into a whole other type of white identity. So, yeah. And before I switch over to chat with Courtney for a bit, could you just, um, I'm gonna say quickly, but it's not so quick, I'm sure. Can you define white fragility for us? Um, I know that white privilege and white fragility are words that an ally these are words that we hear a lot um as white people and you know um I, i'm not sure if everyone truly understands what they mean um yeah and also uh, white privilege which i've stopped using i try to use r white racial advantage, advantage now. right once words get used too much they kind of lose their power right uh they get co-opted white fragility which was a term that was um coined by Robin DiAngelo, who's a, a, a wonderful sociologist who's done a lot of work around whiteness and white culture, I think just basically refers to the defensiveness and the inability of white people to get past their feelings of guilt, of shame, uh, and defending themselves as being good white people to actually listening and growing and changing in ways that we need to in order to be effective co-conspirators. So there's a lot that can be said. She wrote a book that's very well known now, it was on the New York Times bestseller list for a long time. She also wrote a book before that I think is excellent called What Does It Mean to Be White? Which is a really good basic book. Um, basic but you know beginner's mind. I keep re referring to these all the time. There's no way to, I do want to also say you cannot do this perfectly. And part of the fragility also is that uh, white people are so afraid of saying the wrong thing that they're silent, which is much more damaging. Uh, accountability has more to do with what we do if we make a mistake after we make one than trying never to make one and therefore not really entering the fray. So uh, that's also a big part of what white fragility brings that stops us in our tracks. Yeah. Well, thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. And I also want to um, thank everyone who's commenting on our feed right now. We've gotten some, um, you know, people sharing their views and uh, commenting on the conversation. So thank you to Caroline and Jim and Mildred for and Sandra for um, for their comments. 
So let's, um, Bonnie, hang out. We'll be back. I'm going to grab okay. Courtney um, for a conversation now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bonnie. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Ellen. How are you doing? I'm good. So everyone watching, um, if you don't know Courtney, she's the chairperson of Community Relations um, Advocacy Network, which is known as CRAN, which is a municipal committee that's located in Glen Rock, New Jersey. The mission of this board is to address discrimination at local levels and to provide allyship and support to victims, bias, and their families, um, and to promote sensitivity and diversity training within the community. Um, Courtney is also an active member of Bergen Leeds. Um, she, by trade, is a children's book editor. My kids have read many of her books. Um, and author of over 100 children's books with a special focus on diversity, inclusion, and empowerment for all children, especially young girls and children of color. So when I reached out to Courtney and asked her to do this, um, you know, her response, uh, you know, was, well, I'm not sure what I have to um, share, but I'm definitely happy to participate and learn, which I think is exactly, you know, the space that when we talk about, um, and, you know, Bonnie talked about how she doesn't like the word ally, um, but, you know, so many of us, that's the word that, you know, we're still, you know, working with, um, but that that's really the space, that it really is a continuum, that it is a process and um, again, not an identity. So can you tell us a little bit about your role in CRAN and um, you know, being a racial justice advocate, how you address uh, discrimination at the local level in your community? Sure, and I also just wanna start by saying thank you so much, Helen, and thank you so much to the whole YWCA team. Um, we really appreciate the space and the platform to talk about these things, um, even imperfectly, you know, as, as, um, yeah. as you mentioned. Um, Bonnie had it 100% right. I mean, you could have just let her keep talking because she was, you know, so many amazing, important things. Um, but when it comes to community, you know, we really do need to start in our homes. And community is the one place I feel like where we can all really start to affect change. You know, look at what you have, where you where you have access um, and where you have pull and to tap into those communities to do more. Um, as far as the CRAN Group Community Relations Advocacy Network, um, it's a really wonderful group. It, it's a, a community of neighbors and um, people from all over the community. You know, we have, um, we have students, we have teachers involved, we have parents, we have individuals, clergy members, police officers, first responders, uh, liaisons from the municipal council. So it's really great that it's kind of a cross section of all these different groups. So when there is an incident that arises, for example, um, last year there were a couple of swastikas painted in the high school and middle school. Um, there is a group there already in place that you know we can share information, we can make sure that the, um, the incidents are being reported according to the Attorney General's new bias standards. Um, we have a wonderful ally in the Attorney General, Greewall. Um, he has really been doing some amazing work behind the scenes to uh, hold um, our, our state more accountable and um, the institutions in our state, our state more accountable. So um, that's just one thing, you know, building awareness in the community, having neighbors uh, talk about the issues, um, reaching out to our local police force. As I mentioned, we have a, a local liaison um, who's a police officer and also a social worker. So that's a really wonderful um, outlet for me to be able to have a relationship with someone where, you know, he can come to meetings, he can answer questions. Um, because, you know, with the, the George Floyd incident, immediately the questions arose, well, what, you know, what sensitivity training and diversity training do we have in place? Is it enough? Does it need to be expanded? Um, you know, how are what are our hiring practices? What are all these different um, things that we should be looking at? And you know, it's a lot easier for me to do it um, as a white person um, to say, hey, like what what's already going on than it is for someone um, you know who, who doesn't already have that relationship um, to you know to um, to find out that information. So you know even the eight can't wait. I'm sure you've all seen those different um, suggestions about how to avoid police brutality and how to um, have better um, better uh, outcomes um, with interactions with police. So it was wonderful. So now I, you know I was able to find out about what happens in our town. You know what happens um, in some other local towns, other police officers and police chiefs. I also spoke with, um, I encourage them to, 
to issue a statement. They did issue a statement. The mayor and council also issued a statement of my town. Um, so, you know, the places where you have impact to use those places and to use your voice, um, not necessarily for you to speak up, but to either delegate or yeah, create a platform. Yeah. Yeah. Or push other people yeah. um, to do the, to do the work that, that needs to be done that have people that already have the power. So in your community, Courtney, when you do identify a, um, a victim of bias, like you had said, you know, obviously there's swastikas in your school. How are you able to um, support them as a community and through your organization? So that's, that's a really important part of it. Um, you know, because everyone likes to think that, oh, that's not in my town, that's in other places. You know, everyone in my town is so nice. All my neighbors are so wonderful. And they might be, right? But but no town is without discrimination and bias. And uh, because no person, you know, is completely without discrimination and bias. Sorry, my dog is uh, making some noise. You wanna say hi? Say hi. Um, so we're, <laughs> so these are some of the things that, that we're looking at. Um, the important thing is to provide allyship so people know that they're not alone, that they know that there's a group in place that they can reach out to their neighbors who will um, who have experience dealing with these things before. And so they know how, um, how they're able to do, you know, to um, to start making changes in the community. So that might look like in that situation, you know, I wrote a three page letter of recommendations to the Board of Education and the superintendent and said, hi, here's some things that we would like to see. Um, it goes back to looking at the curriculum, you know, making sure that there's programming in place that deals with anti-discrimination and that kids are, are adequately educated um, about these issues. And of course, you know, in our society, we all have so much more to learn you know, myself, like I didn't even learn about Emmett, Emmett Till in school. You're, there's a lot of things, redlining, you know, these major issues about systemic racism that go largely um, untaught. Uh, and so then as an adult, you have a responsibility to inform yourself, but also to look back at the education to say, how can we, you know, how can we do more in our schools um, and police departments and, you know, on our council? On a well I was going to say, I think one of the things that is um, wonderful and for each of us, right, that are, you know, white people trying to, you know, make an impact here is, you know, try to use our platforms to create an opportunity for, you know, education and, you know, allyship or, you know, um, Bonnie's terms, you know, as an accomplice or, you know, however, but, you know, to be able to, you know, bring attention. Um, you know, I know through my work as CEO of the YWCA, I, you know, and being a white woman, you know, I try to speak to our black community and give a, a voice to amplify, um, you know, these discussions and these issues. So you have an interesting um, opportunity yourself and you have used it that being an editor and an author that you have a, a platform. Um, and as I shared, you know, my children um, read your books uh, <laughs> and uh, think I'm a rock star because I know you. Um, but uh, can you share a little bit about how you use that platform and how you know you you know made that space? Sure, thank you, um, and thank you so much for you know for always being so kind about my books. Um, so yeah, so I I was a trade editor and um, I'm now a freelance writer, and so that's given me another platform, right? That you may not traditionally think like, well, how can you know we look at racial injustice within the publishing community? But it's there, you know, it's in all communities. And so I'm looking back and saying, okay, well, what can I do to advocate for more writers of color? There's been a lot of um, pushes in the industry um, by people of color, um, mostly, you know, mostly doing the work, um, especially hashtag We Need Diverse Books. That's a wonderful organization. Um, and it's, you know, really now I feel like the white community, the white publishing community is starting to um, really integrate those, um, you know, those those ideals um, more fully, you know, we still have a long way to go. Um, the, the publishing community as a whole is very white. And, you know, that can go back to a lot of different reasons. But, um, you know, it's an industry where someone referred me for my first job, and that person probably was referred by someone else. And then I referred people for other jobs. So it does stay a little bit insular. And that is true of any industry where people want, um, you know, people really want the jobs, entertainment and the entertainment industry is one of those. 
Um, but as far as my books, I can be sure to always include art notes that um, our art notes are basically um, the author's notes to the illustrator that talk about what to include on the page. So if it's going to be a group of children, then make sure that all the children are in white. You know, make sure that there are some there's some represent excuse me representation for kids with disabilities um, or you know who have um, different family um, organization family or uh, different um, different family types. You know, um, so featuring adoptive families and, you know, step families or um, LGBTQ IA plus families. So that's very important to me. And um, because if you don't write it, you don't know that the illustrator will include it. And then you get back a, uh, you know, an, an art piece that's all, you know, just white people. Um, and that's been a problem for a long time. So that's something that I'm really trying to push. Um, but it shouldn't just be people like me, you know, like I should be, um, kind of amplifying voices of color and figuring out how to connect better, um, to connect people of color in the industry to the people I know, you know, to share my contacts, my resources. And at this point in my career, be able to share my voice, you know, without being worried I'm going to get blacklisted or something, um, uh, you know, to not, to not be scared to actually have the conversations and say, you know, what are we, what are we doing? Like, did, did our company, did the publisher hire a diversity and inclusion officer? Is that something they're looking at? You know, how are we, how are we looking at these things internally so that we can be allies or work to be allies um, in this space? Oh, Helen, I see your mouth moving, but I don't hear you. I <laughs> uh, don't hear you, unfortunately. Um, let's see. But I'm happy to talk more about publishing. <laughs> um, so let's see if we can, let me see if I, oh. okay. So um, yeah, so th those are all different things. Um, if anyone is interested in the Glen Rock um, uh, Community Relations Advocacy Network, um, I encourage them, they can email me at glenrockcran at gmail.com. Um, another thing is to just start one in your own community. Um, you know, sometimes you don't realize the power that you have because you think, well, I'm just a person, um, you know, I don't really know everything about it and what will my neighbors think if I start, um, you know, changing things in town. But the reality is that that is what our power is and you don't have power unless you take it. So I just moved to a new town and now I'm trying to start one here. And I think, you know, as all you have to do is create a Facebook page and say, hey, anyone else interested in starting this group with me? Right. And now, you know, we have 40 members who are looking to start a social justice group in what, what I would have considered a pretty conservative town. So, um, you know, all you have to do is get the ball rolling and not be scared, you know, to make mistakes because we all need to stumble forward. No one's going to be perfect. And uh, just being accountable when you do make mistakes. Well, I think you and Bonnie have both said that now to everyone that it's important that we have to, um, you know, take risks and to move forward and again stumble forward i love that saying too um you know that this is the only way that uh you know we are going to be able to learn educate ourselves and you know dismantle racism and make a difference um and take accountability that sometimes with whatever you know movement forward we make that you know there's work to be done um so look courtney thank you for all you've done and all you've shared we appreciate you being here and um you know i I also I, I also knew connecting you with Bonnie and now Marianne were going to be great resources for you as well. Thank so you. Thank I'm happy for that. So hang out. We'll be back. And um, now we're going to uh, talk with Marianne a little bit. Hi, Helen. Hi, Marianne. How are you? Nice. So everyone, Marianne has been a friend of the YW for some time. Um, we uh, she was she's the recipient of the 2008 uh, the 2018 Racial Justice Award. Um, along as she was named Teacher of the Year, she's won the um, Martin Luther King Birthday Celebration Award and other prestigious awards. She also has co-chaired the Teens Talk About Racism conference for 20 plus years. Um, in our community, the YWCA has supported that effort and the amazing work that she and her um, co-facilitator uh, and, um, you know, uh, innovator of that effort, Theodora Lacey, have, have created some, such impact for so many children, um, you know, over those 20 years and also as a teacher. So we're so happy to have you here, Marianne, and to talk with you. Um, 
And uh, let's see how one of the areas that I thought would be great to talk about with you is young people, because so much of your career has um, revolved around young people and engaging youth in racial justice and social justice initiatives. So can you talk to us a little bit about what changes you've seen about around student activism over the last 20 years? Yes, I, um, as you said, I've been um, leading a co-directing to talk about racism with Theodora Lacey, an icon of social justice in Queen Jersey, who worked with Dr. King when she was a young woman. And Um, Marianne, we're having a little trouble here. Can you hear yeah, me? Better. Yes, what? better now. Okay. Yes. So the better. work the work begins with teens as a journey that starts them where they are, right? What are their identities? How do they see themselves? And they begin then to really unpack the privileges that comes with the construct of whiteness. And they begin to understand how to see each other through a lens of understanding their intrinsic bias, right? The bias that's present in their own in the family members, peers. And really what we do, what we've started to do is engage the students as leaders who, who start to understand some basic ideas like privilege or unearned um, um, opportunities and microaggressions. And they really are excited about leading their peers in conversations. We've been having youth-led conversations for over 20 years. And I have to say, that in the beginning, students, there were always students in our network of 10 uh, to 12 schools, about 160 students per year, who have wanted to have this conversation, um, who have wanted to take on some of the more pressing issues, even when people told them this is a post-racial world. These ideas and these and these um, these concerns that you have are really dealt with. You know, we have a black president, black people can do anything they want. And so often these teens have had to uh, create alliances with teachers in their schools who saw that, um, that it, the journey was cer certainly not over. And so we've seen that all throughout the last 20 years, but what's happening now that's different is that um, students are urgently able to engage their peers. So for example, we were supposed to have a conference March 11th. It was canceled due to COVID. And that didn't stop the youth leaders in at least two, if not four schools, um, two quite formally. Students themselves have created virtual teens talk about racism conferences using the materials that we co-created in Google Documents so that they could reach out to almost 100 peers in their school. And that's never happened before. We've never seen the kids say, okay, it's not over yet. We have to do this, this is urgent, and we have to do this this year before the end of the year. That's something different. I sent out a Google form to the teachers I work with and said, would you like to create an educators network um, to do some work on this over the summer? Everyone said yes. So that's also never happened before. So what I'm seeing now is a kind of a tipping point. We've always had youth leaders. We've always focused on youth empowerment. But what we're seeing now is that these teens are, are noticing that the adults in their world are signing on to the work as well. They're not seeing it as fringe. They're not seeing these youth as nice, but somehow, you know, over youth who care about the thing that's already been solved. People understand through these tragic um, stories that were able to see George Floyd and, and, and so many more that it is not over and we can put on blast um, these injustices. Students are, are, are very excited about working hard together on, on this work. So what role do you think social media has played in getting students so engaged as they are today? What I think can happen, okay, my granddaughter is here. <laughs> All right. What I think can happen um, is that students are able to reach out across the barriers of their schools and communities. Um, Bergen County is an interesting place with 
so many more people of color concentrated in the southern part of the county. And through social media, through Twitter, through um, Instagram, students immediately connect. They have their phones out and they become friends. They can continue the work, they can continue their networking. So their personal learning um, network has become much more beginning, you know, who had an email, who didn't have an email. Now students are ready, they're ready with their phones to document what they see. And 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 as my, my daughter says, you know, things can, are now put on blast, right? Um, you can't hide your, um, your, your, your sort of intransigent, um, persistent racism. <laughs> you know, it's a time when, when students themselves can go home to the family conversation and say, hey, mom and dad, what you're saying is not working for me, and here's why. And they might even put you on, on social media. <laughs> so be careful because, um, the students today are not having it. Yeah. Well, and I have to say, um, you know, watching the young people and how they've organized and the conversations they're having and the bridges that they seem to be building is definitely giving me a tremendous amount of hope. Um, and what does feel different, um, does feel different for sure. Well, the, the youth are, the youth are, have inherited the bias, um, biased uh, living situations um, that their parents have put them in. In the northern part of the county, it's far wider than the southern part of the county, as I said. But, and I remember one time a student coming home in a bus going north to school, she said, oh no, here I am again in this, in this homogeneous world. I'm, it's so boring and so uninteresting to me. So students have noticed that it's not as, as people talk about a bubble, they don't want the bubble. <laughs> they want to be with um, students of color, students who come from different backgrounds, who speak different languages, and they are rebelling against the confines that they've inherited. So before we bring everybody back, Marianne, I'm just curious, of course, I, I happen to know you, so I know that you know you not only have your children, but you have, as you shared, your beautiful grandchildren, um, and the family's always growing. I know I have my seven-year-olds walking around me right now as you have yours. You know, um, you being such a you know racial justice advocate, what are the conversations you have with your grandchildren now? You know, what are the things that you say to them? So our house is like a constant learning experience about racial justice. Um, my daughter is a counselor. Um, my the whole family are educators. So all of the conversations with um, six-year-old Victoria, um, eleven-year-old Olivia, are open. And and my granddaughter Victoria drew a circle of injustice that she she said, look at this is where I see black people. She's a biracial child. My grandchildren are biracial. My all of them are. Um, my grandson is Latino and and European descent, and the other the girls are black and white and other things. And and so she she started to draw this out. Like this is where I see the injustice people to be equal. We can't have this anymore. And she did this as a way of processing the George Floyd um, murder. And so these conversations, people I think are afraid or they feel like they're going to protect their kids. I don't think that's an appropriate response. I think we should have real conversations with our children and have them propose possible solutions in their world. One of the things we've done is infantilize children, infantilize teens for so, so long. How about we listen to their ideas, not just people over 20 or 30 have good ideas. Very young children have great ideas. Maybe we should create a way for these students to become advocates in their own um, schools and communities and certainly in their own homes. We shouldn't be afraid. Have the conversation together. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, why don't we bring back all the ladies now, um, bring back uh, Courtney and Bonnie. And, uh, you know, together. Hello. And there's Bonnie. Nice to have you all back together. Um, 
I, I first of all, I want to thank, um, you know, all of you for, you know, your generous sharing and conversation and helping us um, you know, educate our community. And I also want to thank those of you watching, especially those of you making the comments um, today. Um, there was one question, um, two questions that came up, though. I just want to make sure that I um, pose so we can um, answer. Um, one is, um, uh, Bonnie, can you speak to again why you don't like the word, um, the term ally? Although I can, we can encourage um, our viewer to go back and watch. If you could just share the qu a, a quick response again, that would be great. Sure, I, um, I will. Thank you, Jose, for that for that question. Um, it's not that I'm saying that we shouldn't be in alliance and solidarity with people of color, um, but I think ally infers or implies that we don't have internal work as white people to do within our own communities, within our own families, with our own children, um, and in ourselves. So it's not just external work that we're allying with others, um, but also that we have to do a lot of work on ourselves and in our own communities. So, and also just the sustainability of it. I feel like when things get tough and they will, when we make mistakes and we do and will, um, that uh, we might get fragile and decide to just step out because we're allowed to do that. There is a there is a boat at the dock for white people always. So for us not to get in that boat and you know row away, uh, we need to have an investment, have our own white skin in the game, so to yeah. speak. Yeah. Thank you. And Courtney, it looks like you're getting encouragement to initiate a mentorship opportunity for aspiring authors of color. Yeah, that would be great. There are a number of resources online available um, for, I'm in a bunch of Facebook groups um, that do connect people um, from all different areas um, of publishing uh, with people of color and um, aspiring writers. Um, I also do informational interviews. I'm always happy to chat with anyone um, who, who is interested or, uh, you know, give resume advice or um, kind of help refer people. I think that's a really big way um, that I can help is by, um, I mean, I made a list of 10 things um, this week, kind of looking at my privilege in publishing and ways I can actually um, affect change in publishing. And one of the things was, you know, when I do referrals to do it as if I was applying for the job myself. Um, and I think that's really important because anyone, you know, you could just forward along um, a resume, but, you know, to actually, um, to actually put the time and the work and energy in helping someone is very important. So um, please feel free. You can, if, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to plug my website, but if you well, want you said, you know, everyone not to worry, we're going to put all the links to yeah, the that organizations and that everyone yeah. that we've mentioned here will be putting them. Anita, will make sure we have a link to her website for you Thank added you. in the comments here and we'll make we'll the links. Yeah. I'm happy so, to um, yeah we'll make sure to put them in there. And also we'll um, have links to the other groups that Marianne and Bonnie are connected to and affiliated with as well. And I do do encourage you, you know, at your own to follow their Facebook pages, follow their, you know, um, social media and other platforms as well. You know, these are an opportunity for us to all get educated. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, as we close out, I just want, wanted to make sure that I give you each a, a moment to share what would be your kind of one comment to make to a white person watching who wants to be able to do something? Like what should be their next step? What, what's, a, what's a good next step for them to take? Um, Marianne, do you want to start? Sure. I would say for folks not to be afraid, not to walk on eggshells um, as much as they might feel they need to. Read, be frank, ask people of color to help when it's when when they're in a situation, really take themselves though. Understand, maybe connect with a couple of other white friends and read like White Fragility or How to Be an Anti-Racist or any one of the books that are available and, and start a little book group and start to examine bias. One thing I would say would might be nice is to keep a bias journal. You know, start noticing your bias in your own life. Like reflect each day on something you said or did or learned and think, how might this have been like this? And I would also finally <laughs> folks can take advantage of bias um, 
tools, the Harvard uh, Intrinsic Bias Study, and try to understand where their bias might lie so they can start to unpack it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you for sharing those. Um, uh, Courtney, you want to jump in? Sure. Um, those are really great. Uh, I, I think the, a big takeaway um, is just to remember, it's very easy to think about racism in the abstract and think about, you know, these like alt-right groups or the KKK. Um, the reality is that people like me, people who look like me, um, kind of the, the white women, the Amy Coopers of the world, those are the people that are the daily um, microaggressors and the the daily threats to people of color, you know, because we're the ones that are are calling the police or we're the ones that are complaining about the loud music at the barbecue or, you know, whatever, whatever these things are that um, you see all the time in the news. So, you know, don't think that just because you're not racist, you know, you don't consider yourself racist, that you're not um, part of the, you know, part of the structure. So um, I think that's really important for us as white women. You know, we, we're a lot more dangerous to people of color um, than the stereotype that they are to us. So um, my my action would just like I mentioned, um, just start a Facebook group in your town and just do you know your town for social justice or racial justice and invite a couple people. They can invite a couple people, and before you know it, you can have a whole group um, that shares articles and resources, and then you can make next steps to connect to your town and um, you know and go from there. Um, I'm happy to help someone or help people uh, start that process too, because we need to have it in all of our communities for, for the change to actually go into effect. So, uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Helen and, and the y, YW team for having of us. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you. Bonnie, what would you share? I would share that what I think this work really comes down to is love, compassion uh, for ourselves, for others, particularly when we're working with other white people realizing that we're all on a journey, we're all in different places. Um, it's not a linear journey either, it's cyclic. You can, you know, get triggered and move back, you know. Um, so humility, compassion, and love. Um, it's really about building authentic relationships um, with each other. And I would also say that in getting guidance and leadership from anti-racist people of color, there are so many resources out there that we, we don't even necessarily need to tap into and ask people of color to do some lifting for us. It's wonderful if they're generous enough to do so, but there are also so many resources um, that we can tap into that will give us uh, a path forward. Thank you, Bonnie. And I'd also like to add to everyone watching, um, to um, you know, white people in particular, um, make sure, obviously, I, to everyone, to make sure that you vote. Uh, mm -hmm. Make sure that you, you know, get to the polls um, and make sure that you're putting um, people, yes, make sure that you're putting candidates and um, electing people who represent um, your not only your values um, and what's good for your family and yourself, but what's good for the community. Focus on that love that Bonnie's talking about and think about your black brothers and sisters, your non-white brothers and sisters in your community, as well as yourself, and who are the people that we can put in office that will best support us all. Um, I think very often when we're voting, we think about ourselves, um, and it's a good to have a broader piece. I also encourage everyone, also make sure you fill out your census forms um, and encourage people around you in your lives to fill out your census forms. Um, today is actually a statewide um, census day of action. Um, the New Jersey Department of State um, and Complete Count Commission asks everyone to participate in the Friends and Family Outreach Plan. Um, and it's a, the, the um, program right now is called Call Those Who Count on You. Um, go out and um, make sure that count, ask everyone around you if they've done it and uh, encourage them to do it. And we will be posting a link here um, in terms of the census and um, obviously some voting information here as well. Other than that, I just want you to know this is an ongoing discussion that we will be having at the YWCA. We have this discussion all the time because this is our mission, but we, as I said, we've curated a series that is specifically geared towards um, what's happening right now in our um, society. Uh, we have some upcoming episodes, a town hall that we're working on, a solidarity circle, and um, 
Um, I also encourage you all to join us on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. We will be um, supporting in uh, the Juneteenth Committee uh, of the of the um, Burton County, uh, along with the Martin Luther King Birthday Committee for the Juneteenth celebration. Um, this is the type of opportunity for a white person to learn. If you don't know what the Juneteenth is and why it's such an important day, these are opportunities to educate yourself. So please join us um, and other celebrations that are actually happening on the Juneteenth, which is Friday. But our um, event is here on Facebook at 10 a.m. on Saturday. So please tune in to join us. And if there's someone in your life that you wished had watched this episode, um, don't fret, don't worry. Um, it'll, it lives on our Facebook page and you share it with them. I personally was hosting a watch party um, while we were doing this, um, but this is something that anyone can share to their Facebook page or in groups that you're in um, to help start the conversation, share it with family members. Uh, again, this is part of you know this journey for all of us. So I do encourage you to take the, those steps and um, you know introduce these conversations to people in your life that um, say that they want to make a difference. And so with all of that, we wish you all to stay healthy and well. We have two other YWTV programs this week. We have Diana Ross, who has been with us today. Thank you, Diana, for um, uh, being with us for this event. Um, she is a Clinique Field Executive, and she's going to demonstrate how we can fight fatigue and help our skin look summer ready at 1 p.m. tomorrow. Um, and uh, as I'm looking at how tired my skin looks as I'm <laughs> staring at this camera in front of me, and also on Friday, we're so happy and um, honored. Um, I'm personally honored and humbled to be able to bring to you racial justice champion author Theodora Lacey um, and her granddaughter. Together, they're going to talk about their new book and lifelong work on social issues. And that's 1 p.m. on Friday. And you definitely don't want to miss that. Um, she is a treasure that we are so grateful that we have here in our community. And it's a wonderful opportunity to learn from her. Um, and wonderful to see that her granddaughter is keeping the legacy um, going. So with that, we wish you all to stay healthy, stay well, stay informed um, from good sources of information. And um, uh, we hope to see you soon on another YWTV episode um, and stay connected to all of us. There's lots of links of information here. You can also go to our website, to our resources page, to any of the websites that we've linked here to all of the groups. There's so much information for you and um, stay connected. We'll be offering more opportunities to educate, support you. Be well. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Courtney, Marianne, and Bonnie. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.